So what happens? Well, Cain makes his offerings and God isn't happy with them. Now we don't know how Cain figures out that God isn't happy with his offerings. We get some hints of that too, but the story does tell us that's what happens. And so then we get the psychological response on the part of Cain. Now one response could be, Jesus, I must be doing something wrong. I better straighten myself out. You know, I better come up with a better quality offering and try that again. That isn't what happens. What happens instead is that Cain becomes angry, wroth, and his countenance falls. And so what does that mean? It means this, right? It means he is not happy. He's angry and out for revenge. And so one of the... I've been thinking about this a lot lately with regards to the literature on inequality. Because there's a very good literature that shows, for example, that there's a, there's a, there's a measure called the Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient is a numerical index of the relative inequality of a geographical locale. So, for example, if you went to Newfoundland, where everyone is roughly not very rich, or North Dakota, say, almost everyone there is, say, lower middle class, something like that, or upper working class, something like that. Very little variability. Low Gini coefficient. Okay? And if you go to Miami Beach, say, where everyone's rich, low Gini coefficient. Because it isn't an index of absolute wealth or absolute poverty, it's an index of relative poverty. And so if everyone's rich, the relative poverty is low. And if everyone's poor, the relative poverty is low. Now, one question is, where's the crime? And you might think, well, the crime is where the absolute poverty is high, right? Or the absolute wealth is low. That's where the crime is. Well, that's wrong. If, it's, if things are relatively distributed in an egalitarian manner, the male-on-male -male crime, especially homicide, is low. And it's also the case where everyone is rich. But if you go into places where there's some rich people, but not very many, and there's a lot of people who are comparatively poor, then the male homicide rapes, rates and violent crime rates amp up substantially. And it's a consequence of male-on-male -male competition. And so what you could derive from that and maybe even reasonably, is that you should flatten out the damn income into it distribution because you're destabilizing the society by facilitating male criminal aggression. You can make a good case for that. You know, in, in places like Colombia, where the Gini coefficient got unbelievably extreme, society got so violent that it could barely hold itself together. So, so you, you can make a conservative argument for redistribution of income using the observation that if the income distribution gets too extreme, the whole bloody thing starts to destabilize and might fall. But, but then you also might say, well, wait a minute, is it inequality that's driving the violence? Or is it resentment of the inequality that's driving the violence? Now that's a tough question, because you might say, well, what if the game is rigged and there's no way of moving up the power hierarchy? Well, then maybe anger and, and the desire for revolution is the appropriate response. But that doesn't really mean to me that the response should be the, the sort of thing that you see in high Gini coefficient neighborhoods, which is interracial, intra-racial violence between men. So, for example, in neighborhoods where there's high murder rates, the, the murders are always between young men, and they're always within race. And so that doesn't seem to me to be exactly a politically revolutionary move, right? It's more like, it's more like uh, violent competition for the sake of, of, of attaining status. And you might say, well, that's reasonable, but because the inequality is there and men need to find status because it's part of what drives them forward, it's part of what makes them attractive to women. It's a necessity. Well, the question is, do you attain status through destruction? Or do you start making your offerings, putting your offerings in order? And that's something we really need to figure out because that's a fundamental political question. It's a fundamental political question. Anyways, what happens in this story is that Cain decides that the fact that God isn't accepting his offerings means that he's entitled to become angry and, and, and negative. It, it's, those two things are both put together, right? He's wroth, he's angry, and he's also depressed. And so he's in a state of mind that, well, I think the best characterization for that is hostile resentment. Because it's unfair. It's like, yeah, it's unfair. So what are you going to do about it? You're going to get destructive about it? Are you going to change your approach? Well, Cain, he does the ultimate thing, and this is what people do when they do the ultimate thing. Because that kind of hostile resentment has an archetypal endpoint. And the archetypal endpoint is the point that you get when you're hostile and resentful because you haven't been successful. And then you go sit in your mother's basement for about 10 years. And then you start imagining just how nice it would be if you shot up the local high school so that everybody knew your name. And what happens is you go from 
I'm irritated because things aren't working out for me very well. Two, I'm irritated and I hate those people for whom things are working out well. Two, I'm irritated and I hate the fact that the world is set up so that this has happened to me. And then you go to, well, because I'm irritated and hate the world, I'm going to do whatever I can that will destroy it most rapidly and with the, with the highest possible amount of pain and suffering conceivable. And at that point, then you don't just go shoot up the high school, you go up and shoot up the elementary school. And so if you're wondering what kind of pathway people walk down to get to that point, that's the pathway. And the ultimate cap of that is, well, I'll, 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 I'll kill the kids because, well, we already know that killing the innocent is a lot more effective than killing the guilty. And then just to cap it off, I'll blow my head off at the end just to show you just how goddamn pointless it all is. And so that's the logical extension of Cain's attitude. And you might think, well, that's a bit of an overreading, and I will say it's not an overreading at all, it's exactly what happens in the text. So it's, it's exactly what follows it. So fine. So Cain is not happy. And so who's he not happy with? Well, he's not happy with God. And so what does that mean? Well, we've already unpacked this. He's not happy with the social contract. Because that's part of the spirit, the patriarchal spirit, let's say. And then there's more to it than that. Because we already, we've already analyzed what God, the idea of God might represent in the background of this story. He's not happy with the transcendent. He's not happy with the idea of the Logos, all of that. No faith in the transcendent. Nothing but, he, he does nothing but despise the social contract. And he's got no faith whatsoever in the, the Logos, let's say, the word that brings chaos out of order. He's all got nothing but contempt for all of that. And, you know, certainly you know people like that. And if you don't know them, you just go on YouTube and read the comments, and you'll see all sorts of people like that. <laughs> so, 